This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. A massive Tuesday on tap for today because not only do we have the Tour Championship coming up this week in for the PGA with a lot of cash in the line. We'll talk about that with Brandon Gadula later on. Not only do we have NASCAR odds up for Daytona coming up on Saturday. I'll break that down later as well. We have 16 games on the diamond for today. And we're going to break down the top K props of the night with pitching ninja Rob Freeman getting his favorite strikeout props of the day. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here to kick things off by Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at pitching ninja. You can find him. Fox, Peacock, Nesson, MLB, pretty much everywhere. Rob, once again, we are lucky with a great slate on tap for today. How are you doing on this glorious Tuesday? I am going to need some of your energy to make it through today's day games because, I mean, 60. You got it. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> and your intro goes really hard too. So I'm going to oh, yeah, need, yeah. yeah, I'm all fired up now. Like I was dragging a little bit, but now I'm ready. <laughs> well, see the, I think that when you listen to the intro, like I feel like a cowboy hat is necessary. Um, you know, I've never, never had an inclination towards like chewing tobacco. But it's like, yeah, you know, we'll go towards this, you know, we'll do all the bad things for us. It'll be great. And uh, I feel like that's the kind of, that's the vibe I get from the intro. Uh, so maybe I should tone it down a bit just to avoid bad habits. I think. No, we'll no, I think it's great. And like, instead of fan duel, we have a regular duel. Like right, uh, exactly. Thing. Yeah, you know? I think, yeah. We're in the streets, you know, we're just, we're ready to brawl. And it's kind of a brawl tonight too, Rob, because a lot of good pitchers once again tonight, like some of my favorites, Robbie Ray is out there. We got Dylan Seas, Carlos Rodon is out there. A lot of really fun names. And like you said, you'll need the the, the caffeine to get through all this for today. Luckily, only one day game. So hopefully your schedule can be a bit less uh, condensed in that regard. But when you look at the board for today, with all the fun options we got, what's standing out to you in terms of your favorite strikeout props for today? Well, I mean, I got a lot because a lot of my favorite pitchers are going. But um, I really like Dylan Cease with a little extra rest. I think he's going to be dominant. He pitched well against the O's last uh, a while back. I think he had like 13 Ks or something like that. So I kind of like him re-energized. Um, and then late, yeah, I'm going to be up late. We got Burns and Gonsolin, uh, who like I watch every Corbin Burns star because you never know what you're going to get, and uh, and he's so good when he's on. Yeah, uh, Corbin Burns facing the Dodgers, and that's a tough matchup, and it, it's a tough situation for him to be in. What do you feel like equips Burns to handle an offense that is as difficult as that one? He has so many weapons, and I think he rises to the occasion. I like Corbin Burns being challenged and just unlocking different levels of his stuff. Like he can dominate you with his cutter. He can dominate you with his curveball, his slider. He's got so many weapons and then a changeup too. Like, I mean, you know, low nineties changeup. I don't want to sleep on that. Like you don't know what to expect. And, and I think he game plans well and uh, mixes up his arsenal. Well, so I look for him to do real well tonight. Yeah, Burns is currently at six and a half strikeouts, minus 144 on the over for him, facing off with the Dodgers. And the issue that, you know, you could think about in general with Burns is repeat matchup. The Dodgers just saw him last week, but you mentioned that Arsenal. Do you feel like pitchers are better equipped for a repeat matchup when they have like 16,000 different variations of pitches they can use? So it's kind of like you're seeing effectively a different pitcher the second time you see them? Yeah, absolutely. And I think he's unique among those because he's got like his arsenal in general is, you know, top tier, obviously, as a defending Cy Young Award winner. But yeah, like I think his game planning is great. I think, uh, you know, I look for him to just mix it up a tiny bit differently. And sometimes you have an advantage going against the team the next time out because they saw you sequence one way. And if you just right. mess them up, you know, it, it it could bring a whole different level of problems. And I see Burns doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's Burns. Uh, let's go back to Cease. Six and a half strikeouts, minus 128 at FanDuel on the over for him. And it seems like Dylan Cease, I know he had, you know, not the best start last week, but over the past two or so months, he has been unhittable. Like just absurd. He had like an 078 ERA for uh, like a two month stretch, which is unreal. How? How I, I know that, like, what, what has he done to get to that level of filthiness? You know, a lot of it is confidence and figuring out what works. So, like, 
he is very slider heavy and his slider is the best pitch in the major leagues, like in terms of run value. So using leaning on that pitch and, uh, and he, he also has a lot of things he can mix up. Like when you're talking about an upper nineties fastball, as well as a knuckle curve, um, you know, he's got great stuff and it's just the confidence and pounding the zone more is useful for him. Like he's, you know, he's never going to have top tier command. I don't know. I don't think, but the stuff just plays and it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at Cease, uh, Burns, and Gonsolin for tonight. You're keeping yourself up late. Rob, I want to get you to bed early with my strikeout prop. <laughs> Hopefully you. one we can cash pretty early on because that's on the East Coast and that's Ranger Suarez. And I want to dive into the alternate market for this one because I think I'm okay being a bit aggressive. His uh, number to go over uh, over five and a half strikeouts or get six plus strikeouts is plus 122 right now in FanDuel. Now, it is the same issue we talked about with Burns, where it's a repeat matchup. The Reds did just see him last week, but he was sick. So I want to talk to you about Suarez because, to me, he's fascinating. He transitioned from being a reliever to a starter, and somehow this year has turned into a high strikeout guy at times, too. So again, same question I had with Cease. How did this happen? Yeah, like, I think he's a tough nut to crack as far as figuring out why it works. I mean, he's very deceptive. And he also changes up his pitch arsenal. He's leaning a little more on his curveball, um, dropping down slider usage. So I think getting that spread in velocity has increased his strikeouts as well as being around the zone more. Um, he had started out walking a bunch this year, and then it's not really who he's about, you know, what he's about. And I think he's he's been able to be in the zone, be close, and then change speeds on folks. Yeah, but yeah, I like that pick. Good, yeah, good, yeah. Yeah, it's against the Reds. I've got him projected for, I think, six point something. I should have it up, but I didn't because I'm not fair for that. Anyway, uh, 6.37 strikeouts uh, for Ranger Suarez, my projection for today. We'll see on that one, but I do think being aggressive there is fine given the high strikeout nature of the Reds, some of the guys they've lost recently. I'm okay with that one, and I do feel good about that there. So I do think that we're we're well-equipped for Ranger Suarez for today. Now, I did want to touch on one more thing you'd mentioned that you were talking about the pitch mix change for Suarez. And I care a lot about that personally, because I want to identify when pitches are changing. Do you look at data to identify that yourself? Or is it just because you're watching all these games, you pick up on it naturally? Are you a data person? I person? How do you kind of identify when pitches are shifting their approach? I'm, I'm a combination of it. Like I'll, I'll, I'll watch them. I look at kind of I'll, I'll try to pick up if they're using something different and if they're being, you know, if they're, if they're mostly pitching with more confidence, like mm -hmm. I like to look at body language and figure out why this, you know, if this pitcher feels confident in what they're throwing and then I back it up with numbers. Like I'll always dig deeper, you know, look at pick, pitch usage to see if, you know, a lot of times you'll find in baseball, people's eyes, eyes lie a lot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, mine do too. Like I watch a lot of baseball and sometimes I'll see something and, and I didn't notice it before, but the pitcher had been doing it for a while. So I always like to back it up with numbers. I'm all, I'm fully on board with that too. A blend is the way I want to go. So I love to hear that. And I love to hear your picks for today. Looking at Dylan C's Corbin Burns, Tony Gonsolin and praying for Ranger Suarez tonight as well. That is Pitching Ninja, Rob Friedman again. Check him out on Twitter. Check him out everywhere uh peacock everywhere. fox nesson mlb rob we appreciate the time good luck to you uh, with those for tonight hopefully you're not up too late we get some efficient games on the west coast with a pitcher's duel between gonsolin and burns and we'll talk to you once again next week awesome thanks for having me thank you rob appreciate it and again uh check him out on twitter at pitching ninja if you have not done yourself the favor of following him already we're gonna get to brandon gadula to break down the tour championship and the intricacies involved with that in just one second. But first, hey, college football fans, the 2022 season is just days away, and FanDuel and Xfinity have teamed up to give you a chance to put your college football knowledge to the test. Introducing Xfinity Unbeatable Picks, a free-to-play contest centered around college football's biggest games. Here's how it works. Head to FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash Xfinity dash CFB and make your predictions on which teams will win their week one matchup. If your picks prove to be unbeatable, you want to share $20,000 in cash prizes courtesy of Xfinity. Xfinity Unbeatable Picks is set to begin September 3rd at noon Eastern. So be sure to head to FanDuel.com slash free slash contest slash Xfinity dash CFB and make your picks today. No purchase necessary. 
Let's set our sights now on the Tour Championship coming up this week. It is at Eastlake Golf Course. We're talking about that with Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter, at Gadula13. He is the Senior Managing Editor of NumberFire.com. Brandon, final event of the PGA Tour season. Of course, there is plenty to go on during the fall as well, but are you pouring out a tear uh, with this being the final PGA Tour event of the season? Um, it'll be nice to get a little bit of a reprieve as we enter NFL season because you and I do double duty uh, with NFL season. I thought you were going to say pouring out a tear because we're we just got news that was out Taurus withdrew, um, yeah. which sad on a lot of fronts. Um, hurt his back last week, but I also then and this is not comparable to Willsy losing a chance at you know a lot of money, but I had to rerun everything uh, right before. <laughs> Right before, uh, I think we learned this like about. Oh, I, I slacked you at nine fifty three, and we're recording. Yeah. It's a ten eleven a.m. right now. Yeah, yeah, so I've been I've been grinding. Um, I might have to like halt during my notes because I'm about to recommend Will Z. I liked him as a, a first round leader um, in case the back didn't hold up. But uh, yeah, I might I might say something about Will Z. But uh, I, I think I'll, I'll I'll do my best to monitor myself and make sure I don't do that. Yeah, so in case you did not see, like Brandon said, Will Zalatoris has withdrawn from this event, which does change things quite a bit. Because I think he was going to be seven under to start, and uh, that's important because we have a unique format here with the Tour Championship. So that obviously matters a lot for betting. So Brandon, explain to the good people, if you can, the way this format works for the Tour Championship uh, before the event even starts. Yeah, so we're down to the final 30, now final 29 in the FedEx Cup standings uh, for the PGA Tour season. Based on your standing, uh, you are assigned a particular starting score on the bottom five of the the 30. I'm just going to say 30. It's easier. Um, we'll start at even par. Next five go, uh, are, are one under par to start all the way up through uh, the leader, who is Scotty Scheffler, starting at 10 under par. And I say all the way up, but it's actually Patrick Cantlay is second. Uh, at minus eight. Will Zalatoris was minus seven, and then Xander Schauffele is minus six. So it's incorrect to say Saudi Scheffler has a 10-shot lead on the field. He has a two-shot lead on at least everyone, and then I guess what a four-shot lead on anyone other than Patrick Cantlay. So that's why if you look at the odds this week and see Scotty Scheffler now, uh, he was 250, then 230. Um, he's probably, what, plus 200 oh, now after the withdrawal. So yeah. that's why it looks that way. Um, so just be very, very mindful of, you know, th this format. Um, we've had this format now for three years. Mm -hmm. The past two winners have been that 10 under leader. It's going to be kind of even easier this year, again, without Will Zalatoris in, in the mix, but um, not necessarily uh, with the, the net scoring, uh, not necessarily the right week for long shots because you have golfer, great golfers starting out in front of you and you have a handful of, of great golfers starting out in front of you. So to come from behind, it, it's unlikely and only Rory McIlroy has done that so far. And you can find the starting stroke stuff at just Google it. You can find it pretty much anywhere. If you want to see where golfers are starting again, note that Zala Torres no longer in the field. So that does open up a bit of a gap in that regard. We also do know Eastlake Golf Course. They've been coming here for 15 or so years uh, for the, uh, for the finale what do we need to know about this course in terms of how it plays and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, a great source for this is data golf's course table. Um, but you know, with, with that, we see a lot of, a lot of narrow fairways. Some of them, some of the more narrow fairways that we have on tour, some of the most uh, penal rough. So basically accuracy does matter. Um, it's a, it's a really good course for, accurate hitters but that's not necessarily enough just to be accurate it's a it's a good enough test overall uh that that you need to, you know that all-around skill very easy place to putt which is kind of surprising to end out the season but maybe it's a, a gift to these guys but especially from when within five feet uh data golf has this as one of the easiest courses over the past since like 2016 with shot link data so um the gimme range might be a little bit extended and that could help us target some golfers who maybe struggle from uh, within close in terms of the average green size. It's about normal. It's about an average stint meter. So we're not getting like too quirky. Um, and, and that kind of leads to scoreability. Uh, if we're looking at the gross scores or the 72 hole scores, the, the winners over the past three years, even in this new format would be 18 under 19 under and 17 under. So you strip everything away with the starting scores. We're kind of looking at like a, 
18 under winner, which is not just a true birdie fest, but it's definitely not, uh, you know, super difficult. So guys can move. Um, but whenever you have, you know, for example, Scotty Scheffler starting with a, let's go say a four shot lead on almost anyone else, uh, he doesn't have to do as much. And that's really, really daunting. So, you know, the key stats here, basically gaining strokes off the tee one way or the other, uh, whether you're, you're accurate or long, hit your irons on the green because you need to make those birdies. And then uh, putting on Bermuda would definitely be helpful. Okay, so we do have two separate outright markets we did for this week, and you kind of alluded to that, where you have the net and the gross. I don't understand the difference. I'm, I'm just going to say you have the person who hoists the freaking trophy thing and gets a big check versus the person who has the best 72 hole score across the entire weekend. So we have both those. Uh, what are your favorite bets for the outright markets, whichever one you prefer? Um, yeah, so I, I thought Scheffler at plus 230, he was about an even value in my model. Now that he's down to plus 200, that's, it's fine. Um, because I think that uh, the the one hard part of modeling this week is uh, just mentality. Um, Scheffler's going to play a little bit of a different game. Some of these other guys are going to play a little bit more aggressively to try to, to climb. I will say that the 72 hole format, um, it might sound like these guys are going to sort of only play to try to win the tour championship, but you do get uh, OWGR points based on the 72 hole format. So it's kind of an event within itself. So um, don't write off the 72 hole scoring just because uh, of the net scoring here. But um, I would say Xander Schauffele, uh with the strokes is a real standout play also without the strokes, but great form at East Lake. He's been second, second and fifth the past three years since this new format, he won in 2017 Back in 2020, he also was the gross uh, scoring leader. Would have won uh, if not for Dustin Johnson starting at uh, you know, 10 under par. Rory McIlroy as well. Uh, Jim's, yeah, we can talk about that uh, yeah. for our DFS show later. But uh, <laughs> uh, Rory McIlroy, uh, he was plus 1,000. Uh, looks like he's plus 900 now. Um, two-time winner at East Lake, uh, led last week in strokes gained tee degree at the BMW, but did not putt well. I think if he can, if he putted better last week, we would see him even higher up, um, you know, in terms of the odds. So those are the two, uh, n- uh net scoring leaders that I like Xander and Rory, because I'm not really lo- looking to bet long shots in that market. You still got to surpass a lot of guys as for the 72 holes. Again, the gross scoring leaders the past three years have been a tie last year with John Rahm and Kevin Na, but then Xander, Rory, I guess then Horschel, Justin Thomas before that. So like it's the studs who actually do lead in 72 hole scoring. So even there, you don't want to get careless. Um, in that market, I like Xander as well. Um, I like Patrick Cantlay's kind of a value, same as Scotty. Sh- well, see, I, I'm, I'm kind of thrown off here because I'm, I'm looking at these new odds and trying to figure things out, but yeah, Scheffler, so I would go Scheffler uh, at plus uh, 1,200 um, in terms of the 72-hole scoring over Xander because he's plus 800. I think that that's the right play there. Uh, but as, if you want a little bit of a longer shot, uh, Cameron Young is plus 2,200. Pretty good uh, value in my model. Really good uh, you know, proximity. Hasn't really converted on the, the shorter putts, but it's, again, an easy place to putt this week. And then Victor Hovland is plus 2,700. So just to clarify, I know I got a little scrambled because I realized that my odds on the sheet, on my note sheet were wrong. Um, I think Scheffler at plus 1,200, Cameron Young at plus 2,200, and Victor Hovland at plus 2,700. For the 72 of scoring leader, uh, those are the standouts to me. So you mentioned Rory and Schauffele as being the guys you like for the with the strokes. Yes, I don't know what the best yeah. way to phrase it. Anyway, with the strokes, they're the be- the guys you like to, to actually like hoist the trophy. McElroy is nine to one there versus six to one if you go in the other market. Which market do you prefer, Rory, in between those two? Um, honestly, I'd probably go the seventy-two hole because. Yeah. Uh, He's starting at four under. He did come back and win in 2019, and he won by I think like four shots. It was crazy, but he started at five under. Justin Thomas just didn't like. He didn't was that the year it. he had the new baby narrative? Because I think we need a caveat for that. Or was that the year after? I, you know, it's a real who could say sort of. You know, one of those I mean, situations. Google could say we could. Yeah, Google I mean, we wouldn't be able to find out, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. But yeah, um, Rory is starting from from four under. Uh, so he does have a few names in front of him, I guess. Was it four now without Will Z? Technically, yeah. So yeah, be Sam Burns at five under, Xander at six under, can't lay at eight under, and, and 
uh, Scheffler at 10 under, but um, that's still a pretty solid list of names. And so I would go the 72 hole scoring for Rory. Okay. Same thing for Xander. Um, are you going with the, with the strokes there plus 650 since he's starting at six under? Um, I like, I honestly like both for both, okay. but if I'm nitpicking, um, probably just 72 hole scoring at that rate, okay. just to play a little bit safer. Perfect. Okay. Any non outrights you like for this? We do still have outrights. Uh, any preferences for you there? Uh, yeah. Um, Cam Young uh, plus well, he was plus 170 for a top 10. Uh, he starts three under, uh, tied for 11th to start the week. Again, just, uh, he, he gets in a good position. Uh, fantasy national has him as the leader and opportunities gained over the past 50 rounds should be able to putt better from within five feet. And I went through the head to heads and I, I didn't see a whole lot. So I don't want to get too far. Um, you know, little, like I don't want to get too over eager here, but Scott Stallings minus 142. I know it's pretty heavy there, but over Sepp Straka. Straka is a bit of an outlier to make the top 30. He's the weakest golfer in the top 30, but he's starting at uh, four under par. Stallings is my, uh, starting at three under. So you are giving up a shot and laying some odds, but the difference in skill gap there over four rounds is still showing value on Scott Stallings there. And Straka got here because he played good golf uh, over the stretch, but so did Stallings. So you're not losing much there in that regard either. Okay, so Cam Young uh, now plus 155 for a top 10. Not a huge move there, which is actually okay. Uh, was Zala Torres a drawing? And then Stallings minus 142 over Sepp Straka. What are you laughing at now? Because we got, I had the two different markets to cover. Yeah. With the withdrawal, it was, you know, hopefully people got what I was going for, you know. I mean, I don't understand what I was saying. So if they understood what you were saying, that says a lot about what you your clarity. So I was all good to go until we got the withdrawal. But I guess it's better to get the withdrawal before because I would have recommended some Will Zalatoris. That would have changed yeah, uh, that's true. some things. So it, I was also, wor- it was worth it. I also will say it's a lot. This is a confusing format, but it's a lot less confusing than before when you could have two people celebrate at the same time. Like if someone won this event, but someone else won the FedEx Cup, which I believe happened yeah. in the final year before yeah. they switched. Like that, this is less confusing. So this is the less yes. confusing format. It still got us all jumbled up. Yeah, it, it honestly wouldn't have been that confusing if it wasn't for the withdrawal, because then all sure. the odds shifted, and I was double checking everything. And you know, but yeah. I don't know net versus gross. Those I will never get that. You cannot explain to me. Please don't even try. There's no point. Anyway, that is Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. We'll be breaking down our DFS thoughts on uh, the Tour Championship later on today on the FanDuel YouTube page and on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. Brandon, good luck to you this week. Uh, hopefully, your bets cash, and we'll talk to you whenever there's a PGA event again. I don't know. I guess I'll talk to you in like five minutes, but yeah. they'll talk to you soon. Yes. That's good. All right, let's let's hit let's hit a winner this week. Let's do it again. Check out Brent on Twitter, twi- Twitter, Twitter at Gadula13, the senior manager of numberfire.com. Okay, let's talk now about some NASCAR at Daytona. Again, I'm here tomorrow. I'm gonna be talking about some college football with Ed Fang, but I'll be out on Thursday, Friday. Typically, I dub NASCAR on the Thursday show, but let's do it for today uh, because I'm gonna be gone later on this week. There are three outrights I like for this week at Daytona with the NASCAR Cup Series and its final event of the regular season. Those are Ryan Blaney, Chris Bell, and Eric Jones. Starting with Blaney, he's 12-1 to at FanDuel Sportsbook, and he's actually the favorite to win this race in my model. I've got Blaney 8.8% to win this race versus 7.7% implied, so that's a pretty good mark, pretty good value there. Uh, still below 10% I've got him, but still a value. We know Blaney can mop up on the super speedways. He had back-to-back wins in Talladega. He won this exact race last year. He was pretty close to winning the Daytona 500, got uh, put in the wall by his teammate. Now needs a win to make the playoffs. Like he could get in via points, but I've got like 44% odds that a driver not currently in the playoffs wins this race. So Blaney can't really afford a points race because there's a very good shot. He misses the playoffs if he does. Blaine is a great uh, pack racer. We know Fords tend to be very strong here. His teammates, Joey Logano, Austin Sindrick, are locked in. So maybe they uh, give some more aid to Blaney as well to try to get him in the playoffs. I know 12 to 1 is short for a super speedway, but I've got that accounted for in my model and it's still showing value on Ryan Blaney. So 12 to 1 to me, a very fair number for Blaney to win this week. Chris Bell is 25 to 1 at FanDuel. He doesn't have the track record of Blaney in terms of finishes, but. He's always running up front. Bell has run seven pack races with Joe Gibbs racing. He has had a top 11 average running position 
in six of those seven races. And that means he's not getting into trouble until late. He is at the front. He's lurking. He's competing, uh, trying to lead laps and stuff like that. He did finish top five in one of those. Now, what that means is he has failed to convert into a top five finish despite having a lot of good runs. That's a concern because it does take a certain skill to finish and capitalize on a super speedway. And Bell has not shown that yet, but I've got him at 5.6% to win this race. His implied odds are 3.9%. I think I'll be higher on Bell than most this week. So not as much of a rush to bet this one if you versus Blaney and Jones, but I do think that Bell 25 to one is a good value accounting for some of the issues he has had closing things out despite having fast cars on these super speedways. As far as Eric Jones goes, he's 24 to one at FanDuel. You can still get him at 35 to one at Caesars. Last I checked about a half an hour ago. I love that. Uh, he's 4.3% to win for me. So I'm actually showing value on Jones at 24 to one, but his implied odds at 35 to one or 2.8%. If you can get 35 to one, Jones is my favorite outright bet of this week. If you can make just one bet this week, get Eric Jones at 35 to one. He has the third best aggregate average running position on the pack track so far this year. Uh, that's behind just Chase Elliott and Ryan Blaney, where the two most likely winners in my model. He could have won Talladega at 70 to one. I was watching that on Twitter when I was on my honeymoon in France. Not, I was not paying attention to the race. I was just watching on Twitter, promise. Um, he was leading on the last lap there, took the white flag in first place. Didn't win, but could have won that race. He has won Daytona before. It was in very good equipment, but again, the equipment gap this year much smaller than it has been in years past. So I, I want to be on an Eric Jones. I think that if you can just get 24 to one, I might not be as in, as enthusiastic. It's about 0.3 uh, percentage points of value for me there, but if you can get him 35 to one, 30 to one, something like that, I am all in on Eric Jones once again for this week. The non outright markets, a, not a ton of value there because they. I mean, I'm not going to show uh, value in anybody at less than even money to finish top 10 at a super speedway. And a lot of guys are less than even money. So we need to find some long shots here. The one I do like is David Reagan uh, at 10 to 1. I've got his his odds to finish top 10 around 20%. That seems too high. I would take the under on that number. Personally, I think the model is a little bit too high on him. But the reason that's high is because we've seen Reagan finish top 10 with this team at this track this very same year. He's driving for Rick Ware Racing, obviously very bad equipment, but he finished eighth in Daytona back in the spring. And now we're getting potentially a higher chaos race because it's the final race of the regular season. And it's also just three fewer drivers in the field. And that does matter. That does boost the odds for everyone because there are just fewer competitors in there. So Reagan... 10 to 1 to finish top 10. I really do like that. Uh, he's had a great history at Daytona. He's actually had a win here way back in the day and better equipment, but I still think 10 to 1 is too long despite his equipment. I think that with this high chaos race, we're going to see a lot of weird stuff happen. That could benefit David Reagan. I also do show some value in Landon Castle, 15 to 1 finish top 10. Not talked myself into that one yet, but have talked myself into David Reagan, 10 to 1 to finish top 10. So again, David Reagan, 10 to 1, finish top 10. Eric Jones, if you can get 35 to 1, take it. If you can get 30 to 1, take it. If you can get just 24 to 1, I still show value, but a harder decision there. Chris Rebell, 25 to 1, and Ryan Blaney, 12 to 1 to win this race. That's all we got here for today. Big thank you to Pitching Ninja, Rob Friedman, for swinging by, breaking down his favorite strikeout props for today. Thank you to Brandon Gadula for talking about the Tour Championship uh, and his favorite bets for that. We'll be back once again tomorrow with Dr. Ed Feng breaking down week zero of college football. I will talk about my Northwestern Wildcats, the reason I'm out uh, later on this week to go watch them over in Ireland. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about more Ed's model overall. That'll be tomorrow. To get that as it goes up, just subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, please leave us a rating and review as well. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets for tonight. If you go in on some K-Props, we'll talk to you once again tomorrow to talk about some college football. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 